welcome everybody. So this is, um, this is a session I, I put together basically to, um, I guess, scratch an itch. Um, it's, it's primarily kind of targeted at, uh, I guess you'd say, large organizations, so governments, nonprofits, libraries, um, you know, museums, those kinds of larger organizations which are starting to embrace open source in quite a big way. Um, so let me just see if click it working. Sorry, one sec. All right, there we go. Yeah, so I just wanted to say um, for those people who are here, I know there's quite a lot of, of uh, representatives from universities and, and government here today. So I just wanted to say, first of all, welcome. Um, it's great to see um, governments and universities and these larger institutions starting to participate in the Drupal community. So thank you. I think it actually strengthens our community having you here. Um, and thanks for, if you're here in this, in this room, thanks for coming along to this session. Um, and I, but for those who aren't in those organizations, I think there's a few things in here I think you'll get a lot out of as well. So um, yeah, so Drupal South is essentially about sharing ideas and um, I wanted to share my ideas about how you could best work with open source in your organization. Um, so who am I to tell you how, how to run it? I'm not, um, I've never really worked in government or a large enterprise or an institution, um, but I wanted to share my experience from working uh, in the private sector for a, a web agency who's been working with open source for quite a number of years um, and um, how I can share that experience and maybe you can benefit from that. So this is my background, um, been with um, co-founder of Previous Next, um, which has been running for about seven years. Uh, one of the, the co-creators of Agov, um, and obviously deeply involved in Drupal, so I'm the top 50 core contributor to Drupal, and also working a lot with the, the team behind GovCMS. Um, but we are in the middle of a, 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 a paradigm shift, if you're not aware already, um, but what does that actually mean? And I think what I, the way I see it is that some of the ways that we've been working um, over the last few years, is, is we're changing. We're changing the way that we're actually working. Um, and partly due to, to this. Um, so it's a few years old now, but I think that actually was one big change in the direction of how especially governments work. Um, and one of the, the key things in that circular were Australian government um, must consider open source software. Um, it must be given fair consideration. Um, and also, this is one of the key things that I wanted to focus on today, which is essentially government agents will need to actively participate and contribute back where appropriate. So I think that's a, uh, a big change. OK, but why, why, what is driving this change? What was the reason that um, open source in general is actually um, being adopted, and why is it being needed? Well, there's a few things. Um, essentially, the users are, are, are driving this change. They want more digital services. They want more open data. Um, they want it on any device, and they actually want it pretty quickly. Um, and I think this has been difficult for um, in larger institutions to be able to accommodate, be able to accommodate that, that rapid change and the, and the breadth and depth of the, the uh, digital services they're actually providing. Obviously, internet usage is going up, and um, yeah, according to my calculations, we'll hit 150% internet usage in the next 10 years, which is interesting. Um, and, and even more so, mobile devices are going up. I mean, this is just this is, um, from last year. Um, but the percentage of users using mobile is, is going up. So essentially, on any device. So we need to be able to build sites that um, accommodate that, and that obviously requires uh, you, you renewed investment in, in online technologies. Um, so, but how do we accommodate it? How are we able to do that? Um, we can look at how the private sector does it. We can look at how um, you know, the smaller agencies do it. Um, some of those things are around being agile, using agile processes, uh, lean methodologies, um, continuous delivery, and essentially continuous process improvement. Uh, well, how can we do it um, with Drupal, basically? So, I mean, we're at Drupal Conference, so I want to focus on that a little bit. Um, how do we do it with Drupal? So, some of the features that, um, of Drupal that uh, 
will help with this is essentially we're, um, we're working with a framework which is very agile. And by that, I mean um, modules or co contributed modules for Drupal get released very, very quickly into the wild. So if you're working with uh, proprietary software or um, your own in-house software, um, it's very hard to actually respond when new technologies come out or new features or new services come out. So um, for example, things like um, Google Capture, they released a new way of actually doing Capture, which was you know, um, much improved on how they used to do it. Um, that required a new API. There was a module for that within hours of that API being released. Um, that's quite a rapid turnaround. Um, and that is common with, with a lot of um, Drupal features. So modules that are released very, very quickly after a service is available. Um, it's also extensible. So um, by that, I mean you're not tied into you know, what Drupal core provides. You know, you've got this massive community out there of, of contributed modules. And if there's something that doesn't actually meet your needs, uh, you can go and build it yourself. So you can extend it. You can make changes to it quite easily. Um, and you can actually customize existing behavior quite easily. So it's very flexible and, it's, and uh, rapid in terms of what you can, uh, how, how quickly you can get features out. So, so what's the paradigm shift? So I think the way um, I would summarize this paradigm shift is essentially what we're moving from is the role of being a consumer to the role of being a producer. Um, so um, essentially, um, you know, we are consumers, obviously, in, in a lot of ways. So if you, you're, uh, you know, you're on Facebook, you're using Facebook. Um, um, but what I mean, really, in, in this context is like we're, instead of consuming CMS software, so instead of consuming a proprietary concept uh, management system, um, how do we actually um, participate a, a little bit more and, um, and give back? So a consumer of, of this sort of software would essentially just sit back, wait for software releases to come, wait for bug fixes to come. Um, if they're doing coding, they would do that potentially in-house, privately. Uh, you know, they build up their own functionality. They may do things in a custom way that's not done you know, in other organizations. Um, and they're not necessarily going out there and collaborating with other people. They don't really care about that. Um, they're mainly focused on what they're doing in, internally. Um, but what producers do is they're actually doing the opposite. They're out there sharing the code. They're collaborating. They're participating. Um, and they're engaging in the community. So they're giving back into the community. Um, and I'll talk a bit why, why that is actually um, important. So um, when you're sharing code, essentially what it means is that you, it needs to be high quality. Um, it needs to be well tested, well documented, well supported, so maintained. And it actually provides a lot of transparency um, into you know, what's going on, because people can read the code, right? Um, you know, but with commercial software, essentially, you know, you, you, you're not, you don't have any of that control. You're, not, you're locked into release cycles. Um, you don't have any control of any um, priorities and what features actually get released. Um, there's often large support fees and you know, restrictions on what kind of support you can get. And essentially, you've got vendor lock-in. Um, you know, obviously, commercial, soft, um, commercial software often has a support model around it, so service level agreements and priority tickets. Um, but this isn't necessarily exclusive to um, you know, uh, commercial software. You, know, you can get that with, with Drupal, for example. OK, so this is the key. How do we actually make the most uh, of working with open source software? Um, so I'm just going to take you a few, a few things um, to consider. So first of all, quality. Um, so just as an example, if you're contributing to Drupal, um, these are some of the criteria that you actually need to have to submit a patch to Drupal.org. Um, so it's obviously got to follow coding standards. It's got to be accessible, so that's a key gate in terms of the feature that you're adding. It's got to be secure, so it will need to, um, it'll be reviewed for security. It's got to be performant. It's got to have tests. So all the code that you provide needs to actually have tests. And of course, it's got to be peer reviewed. So the process of contributing to Drupal.org is that it needs to get through to a um, uh, RTBC state, which is essentially 
reviewed and tested by the community. So people actually have to put their eyes on it, look through it and comment. And often you'll go through these feedback loops where you'll get comments and then you go make changes and, and it could be, you know, you know, 50 patches long when you actually finally get one that's actually accepted. Um, but I think one of the things that you sh need to consider as well is that um, the real power of so uh, open source software is its is co-creation. So it's technical innovation that actually um, is happening with open source software. So we're not only you know, getting well-tested code, we're actually getting um, new ways of doing things or innovative ways of doing things. Um, and I guess this is a question is, um, if you are, putting all, are maintaining all your own in-house code, um, how you can support it yourself. So um, how many people do you have in your organisation that actually understand that code and can actually fix bugs in it or um, fix security issues? Um, what kind of audits are you doing? So are you doing accessibility reviews of your code, um, security, accessibility, performance reviews? Um, and are you following best practices? So you know, do you have standards around the code? Do you have commenting standards? Do you have... Um, just these simple things like code style standards. Um, but so by pushing code into the public domain, you're, you're kind of, you're enforcing this um, on, your, on your own code. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about process. And I know that um, most of you would have heard of these concepts before, but this is something that I think that is very important when it comes to um, working with Drupal in particular. So, um, the key is really just around trying to adopt a startup culture. Um, there's been talk about this in government and other institutions as well. How do you actually work um, as a startup would in those organisations? Um, and a few of the key things are around the process and just um, around things like concepts like minimum viable product. So, um, who's familiar with Scrum in here? Yep, most people. Um, so one of the key things of Scrum, which I find um, really important, is that there needs to be lots of communication. So um, by that, it's, it favours uh, communication over, over documentation, um, you know, large upfront specification type documentation, um, because it realises that in order to be agile and be able to react quickly and actually build a valuable product, you've actually got to be having direct communication with the um, you know, the business owners, the people who, people who own uh, that domain of knowledge in order to be able to deliver what they want. Um, it features our short iterations, so we've got um, short feedback loops in terms of delivering products, um, and lots and lots of testing. So because we're not doing upfront specifications, um, we need to be doing automated testing on all the work that we do, so we, can, we have confidence that it's actually meeting uh, meeting quality standards. And as I said, early feedback and also frequent releases. So we're not doing these kind of big six months, 12 months, you know, two, three year projects where no one actually gets to see it until the very end and they say, that's not actually what we want. Um, and also minimum viable products. So this is ties into the whole release early and release often concept. So um, this is a a graphic which I, I thought was really appropriate. So um, it doesn't mean that you're kind of delivering half-baked products along the way or half-baked site. You're delivering the core functionality first and then you're extending and enhancing it as you go along. Um, so at every point, you know, you actually got something that people can find useful and actually like. Um, so I think the key thing, message around this is don't try to, um, to gold plate features. Start thinking about how can I just achieve the core functionality of of, of what I need, um, and then you know release it out there, get feedback on it. Um, that could be released internally, so you know, outside your your core team. Release it, get feedback, and then use that to help you prioritise what the next the next features are, um, because you can be guaranteed that your your priorities are going to actually change once you've got feedback. Um, you can't make, be making assumptions around you know, what, what people will find valuable until they actually get to see it. Um, and it helps you actually reduce wasting time on unwanted features, right? So um, you might think that this feature is really fantastic, and by the time you actually deliver it, people are like, well, we actually, like, we, don't, we don't need that. So 
uh, which does happen. Um, um, to build a team. So a lot of organizations are actually hiring internal developers. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to skill them up. They're working with um, partners or consultants like Previous Next, like us. Um, but how do you actually make that team succeed? Um, so the first thing I think you need to do is actually what, what's actually going to be motivating your developers. And I'm talking about developers. This could equally apply to, um, to anyone in your team. But um, I guess the key to, to working with open source is try to understand uh, what's, they're gonna, what's gonna be their key motivation. So these are some of the things that actually um, developers are motivated by. So first is altruism. So that's basically, you know, um, especially in the case of Drupal, so they may be contributing to uh, um, software because they understand that it will be used by nonprofits, for example. They can have a software they can download. It has very low cost. They're not paying license fees. Uh, they get a lot for, for very little. Um, and, and I think um, there was a good example of this altruism when I was in, um, I think it was 2000 and 2010. Um, I think it was DrupalCon. Uh, could have been Portland. Um, there was um, an earthquake in Haiti. And um, on the sprint day, we were all there. People were working on Drupal Core. Um, and a, a table basically sat down and said, let's build a site um, that can be used by people who are looking for accommodation in Haiti, and they can basically put up, um, you know, like, I've got spare accommodation, and people who are looking for accommodation could find that, and they could match up and essentially, you know, um, find, find housing for these people. Um, and I think that was a real, real important kind of light bulb moment for me, because I, I realized that a lot of people who were working, um, or who were there at the DrupalCon, were doing it because they wanted to make you know, the idea of a public good. They wanted to improve, um, you know, the life of others, and, and, and they can do that by, by building software. Um, there's also a key motivator, which is essentially around um, just being part of a community. So being involved um, in a network of like-minded people um, and trying to build something together. Um, and I, th I think a key one is essentially people being motivated by recognition. So um, Drupal, there's lots of kind of different um, uh, ways that, in, especially in Drupal, working in Drupal core, um, that people actually get recognition. And I think um, yesterday, Angie, in her keynote, was talking about, um, you know, she highlighted some people, right? So she, she went and showed their profile. She was talking about how many commits they had. So she was saying, OK, this person has more than 150 commits, right? So these are the key, there's, there's, and they're not great metrics, right? But there's some key points that, that you need to recognize that people are motivated by um, the kind of recognition that they will get within the community, especially with open source developers. Um, so number of commits, you know, what working groups they're involved in, what teams they're part of, whether they're a maintainer of a module in Drupal Core are all key drivers for people to actually be motivated in the work that they do. Um, and actually, Drupal.org is putting a lot of effort now into trying to improve the recognition, not just of individuals, but of organizations that are actually contributing to Drupal.org. So there's a lot of work coming out um, pretty soon where you'll be able to say, um, I, you know, I worked on this bug. I fixed this. Um, who do I want to attribute the, um, you know, this work to? And you can actually choose whether it's yourself or whether it's an organization that actually, um, actually uh, you know, participates. So people start building up. You know, profiles of your company or your institution to be able to say, well, this, this company is actually you know, backing the you know, contributions to Drupal.org and then build up your, your profile. Um, and the last one really is just around um, creative expression. So if they're, a lot of people, um, if they're, they're open source developers, they're, um, you know, they might be working on whatever they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. It might not let them actually do the things they really want to do. So they want to be able to go and build something in a really cool way or use a new tool, um, often it's a really good motivator for them if they can contribute in a way that lets them kind of express their, um, their creativity. Um, so how do you actually keep open source developers' skills up? So um, this is very different, I think, to uh, you know, how you would traditionally send people off to training courses. If you're working you know, with Microsoft or um, a, you know, some software where it's 
It's very kind of um, very. Uh, there's, a, there's a curriculum for, for doing certain training courses. Um, the best way I think to train developers in open source is actually get them to start contributing. Um, get them to write patches. They will have to. Um, they'll have to look at, at all the APIs that are that are working under the under the hood to be able to actually understand what's going on to be able to fix fix patches. Um, and open source contributions are a massive, a massive um, way, uh, way to for them to Im actually improve their skills. They'll get feedback on their work. Um, if any of you saw um, Lee Rowland's session um, yesterday, he was talking about his his kind of process of learning, going through doing Drupal core contributions. He was actually learning all the time. He's, he's, he said his skills had grown like tenfold. Um, from his time actually participating, and that's not that that's not like being a genius and uh, and you know just being someone who's skilled and um, I mean even though he is, um, it's more about it's more about like his participation. He was p persistent and he went back. He got feedback and he kept going. And I think that is the key. It's the participation part there that that was able to raise his skill levels. And I think that's really important when you're building your own teams to think about how can I. How can I keep their skills relevant? How can I build up the team and, and, um, and, and improve their skills? Speaking at events is another one. Um, as you might be aware, like when you actually speak at events, you actually have to know what you're talking about. So you know, that's a good driver for people to actually get up and talk confidently about a topic that they're passionate about or they're interested in. Um, and it also helps their communication skills and the ab ability to, to go out and spread the knowledge of what they do. And a key one, as I said, is just participating at the, in the community. So um, being involved in discussions, coming along to these sort of events, um, and, and engaging with the community. Um, yeah, so what are the outcomes? So if you are involved in open source contributions, um, so um, you'll learn the latest technologies. Um, you, we'll build a stronger community. So Drupal, the Drupal community will benefit from your participation. Um, we'll get different ideas coming in that we, we, we might not um, understand. So if, it, if, if uh, Drupal South was essentially just um, all developers all sitting around talking about the latest cool technology, we'd miss out on insights of what it is that different organizations actually need. You know, um, we, we had a great um, keynote this morning, um, I thought, which is just, it's not often that you get the perspective of you know, user experience and design. Um, and it's really refreshing, I think, as a especially as a developer, to actually go, right, I, yeah, this is another, another kind of um, thing that we all, all need to be considering. So I think that cross-pollination of ideas and getting input from, from different organizations and different uh, institutions actually really helps um, strengthen the community and gives us a better understanding of what's, what's happening. And I think that one of the key things I mentioned before is actually building a reputation. So um, this applies specific, you know, especially to to, um, to Drupal developers. So um, I was on a, a panel in DrupalCon Austin, which was basically just um, Drupal shops. Um, there was a bunch from the US and from Europe, uh, and I was representing Australia. Um, but it was all talking about how we actually recruit, how we actually find developers. Um, it was really interesting to, to discover that we all had a similar process, and it was all around looking at that particular developer's online contributions. So we would look at what have they, what have they been doing on GitHub? Um, have, they done, have they presented any, any sessions? What modules are they writing for Drupal core? Um, how well are they maintaining the issue queues of the modules they maintain? So um, it's all around their reputation, and, and that's all available online, right? You can see what people's contributions are. Um, and that is a huge, that's way more valuable than um, you know, just saying, yes, I've completed these courses, and I've got this level, and I'm, I've done these kinds of projects, because um, you can actually see what their, their work is in practice. Um, OK, so how do we actually make the shift? If we're, if we're trying to move to a model where we're actually um, embracing open source and, and trying to work with the communities, how do we actually make that shift? And I think in terms of your organization, one of the key things is actually just be very clear about what your vision is. What, what, what are our, what's our goal for working with these technologies? Um, what are the values of the organization that we want to be, be um, instilling in the team? Um, so challenge some of the underlying truths. So, so the, by these, I mean like um, 
you know, there's, there's lots of um, uh, assumptions there, like open source isn't safe. We shouldn't be sharing any code with the outside world because it'll expose us to vulnerabilities. People will be able to see our code and work out how to hack us. Um, you know, so challenge those assumptions. Like, okay, well, what, what's the truth about that? You know, what, what's, um, what's the reality about those assumptions? And often the reality is that it's actually much more secure to actually have your code peer reviewed by thousands of people as opposed to the five people that might be in your development team that, that um, may not be experts in security. Um, try to skill up your aligned team members. And what, by that I mean, um, Work with people who are who are um, who share your core values. You know, are they aligned in terms of their core values? Try to skill those people up, um, and and in order to be unified as a team and cohesive as, as a team, it really requires lots of communication. So um, that is communication from you know different levels of the business talking to each other. So you don't have segregation and these teams off here doing their own thing. They don't really understand why they're doing it. Um, yeah, so basically, um, be clear about the core values and belief. Um, encourage team participation in that as well. So um, it doesn't have to come on high. What, you know, discovery about what your core values are and what your, your beliefs are. Um, encourage participation in that. Um, you know, you essentially, by, by getting participation, you're guaranteed to get more buy-in from the team um, who, who share that, that vision. Um, and actually provide an, a, a roadmap for how we're actually going to implement this change. So um, for talking about a, an organisation saying, OK, we're rolling out Drupal, um, this is the goal that we want to actually um, achieve, this is the outcome. Um, how do we actually get there? So you need to be able to provide a kind of action plan for how, actually how you plan on doing that. It's not good enough to have just the vision without a, um, a way to actually action that. Um, and this is, I mean, might, might be controversial, but um, try to build, it, build your team around those core values. So um, often you'll have um, people who are experts. So they may be, um, especially in, in a, um, I guess, a relatively small community like Drupal. I mean, it's, it's a big community, but you know, um, often if you go out and you say, OK, we're just going to hire all the experts that we can, that actually can be detrimental to the team if they don't share the core values of your team. If they aren't aligned with that, so um, sometimes it's better to actually remove those people out of the team, um, not have them um, disrupting your team. Um, it's much better to actually have uh, more junior team members who are aligned with you and skill them up, and that way you'll actually build a much more unified team, a lot more um, cohesive team. And, the, and another key point is that your team members may not be necessarily all in the same location as you. So um, previous next, we're, we're very distributed. We have people, you know, in Queensland, Canberra, Sydney, and two different offices. Uh, people in Melbourne. So we're. Um, it's not necessarily all about having to have people sitting at the desk and watching them nine to five to make sure that they're doing their job. Um, you know, your best team members not, might not be sitting right next to you. Um, communicate. So um, as I said before. Um, uh, Often, uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a traditional project, I talked a bit about Scrum, in a traditional kind of waterfall project, you'll essentially you'll have you know, one team do um, IA and design, and they'll just chuck it over the fence and go, here you go, go implement that. Um, you need to have basically have a unified team where you're talking through all of those kind of problem-solving decisions. With, with the user experience team, with the developers, with the business owners who actually understand the problem that they're trying to solve, um, so that you're actually working very collaboratively. There's not, and that is, that is direct communication um, between the product owners and the team members. We're essentially trying to solve the problem together. Um, and communication through wireframes and al alone is not, not enough. Uh, and this is a key feature of Agile. Right? So, um, not only does it strengthen your team and build, build up a stronger a team of open source developers, um, you know, it's actually part of the process as well. So, um, and this is probably the key message I want to give away is, um, is essentially the, your key to success with an open source team is essentially to engage with the community. 
Um, so attend, attend Drupal South, which some of you have done. Um, uh, collaborate with the community, get involved in discussions. So it was great to see um, yesterday there was a, um, a boff for Drupal in universities and we had people from um, different universities who hadn't really ever spoken to each other and they, we sat in a room and we actually talked through common problems that we're trying to face. And it wasn't a technical talk, it was really just um, sitting there saying, okay, what's the problem space that we, we have? How do we actually share these problems? Um, and I think that's, that's the power in, in essentially in being engaged in the community is that you can actually try to um, help each other to solve the same problems. I mean, a lot of the time, you, you know, you may be competitors, but you're essentially working in the same, same problem space. You are looking at the same um, technology solutions. Um, there's a lot to, to be gained out of um, sharing your knowledge and, and what you're doing and, and learning from others. Um, yeah, so get involved in, in, in the open source software itself. So if you find a bug, um, don't just kind of fix it in your local fork of that, that code. Submit a patch up to drupal.org. Explain you know, what, what the problem is that you had. Um, provide a patch if you can. So basically fix the problem and share it. So um, part of the process of what we do when we're building and when we build agov is essentially um, we never have any any um, bug fixes that don't exist on Drupal.org. You find a bug, and it could be an accessibility issue with the module. The first thing you do is you post a patch up on Drupal.org so that other people can start participating in that discussion. It might be that you made some assumptions about how, what that module did, and your assumptions are wrong, but by the point of actually posting a patch up there, um, you, you're gaining that knowledge and you're understanding what, what the issues are. Um, share your knowledge, so talk. Talk at sessions, provide information about what you're doing, um, which I know a lot of um, uh, organizations are doing, and, and share your code. And I, I don't know whether everyone's heard of pay it forward, but the idea is that essentially, um, you know, you, you try to contribute more than you actually get back. So try to um, over contribute rather than just um, assume that other people are going to be providing you with, with um, all the tools that you need and you're just going to consume them basically. Yeah, so that's my key message um, for the take-home message for today is engage. And um, yeah, thank you. I've got some time for questions if anyone's got questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Pam. Besides going to conferences like this one, what are some other ways people can engage with their local communities? <laughs> Thanks for asking, Pam. Um, so, um, look, there are, there are local meetups, and um, there's, there's Drupal meetups in every city. I know that um, I know South Australia, there's um, not specifically you know, like a Drupal meetup, but there is a, um, like an open source meetup where you can go and talk about open source and Drupal. Um, and one of the key things that um, we're finding as well, it's not necessarily about just sticking to the Drupal community. So, um, in Sydney, for example, there's, there's JavaScript meetups, there's PHP meetups, there's CSS meetups. Um, so it's not about just participating in just one community or the Drupal community. Um, you really gain, gain a lot from actually participating in lots of, lots of different, um, different communities and sharing that knowledge across them. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>